All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Human Evolution Project. Uh, my name is Ms. Bahawk, and I'm here with Bryce Smith today, and um, uh, we're, we're creating some space for you uh, and uh, for ourselves. And that's kind of uh, partly what we want to dive into today is this whole idea and concept of space, not just holding it, but what it is, how you acquire it, how you maintain it, what it looks like in different contexts. So. Um, Thanks, Bryce, for bringing up this suggestion because it, it sent off just a ripple effect of things in my mind, as it usually does when you suggest a topic. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, how are you? I'm great, man. It's it's so awesome to connect with you around things that typically float at the forefront of our brain, you know, throughout conversations, experiences, and um, life's moving fast for me over here recently. There's events. There's the CrossFit Games open. There's uh, managing businesses, there's podcasts, there's a lot going on. And so, you know, it almost feels like everything just like pushed together mm -hmm. and they're all really fun. They're all such an honor and a privilege to partake in. But sometimes in the midst of the chaos, we get so jumbled or so stuck because there's not a lot of space that we actually need to zoom out. Maybe the analogy for people as we're approaching spring could be a version of spring cleaning. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe there's things that you don't use that you don't that don't serve you within your journey in that moment. And you're like, OK, I'm going to I'm going to toss some of these things. I'm going to donate this. I'm going to sell that. And you're creating space. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it, it allows for creativity. It allows for more innovation. Um, you and I often on this podcast talk about flow and it's tough to flow when there's no space to flow. You look at, you know, an NFL running back or Reggie Bush in college. Mm -hmm. Those guys need space in order to be creative and use their speed. But sometimes in the jumble of the offense and defensive line, there's not as much space for those guys to exercise their, their craft. Right. And, you know, hopefully some of these metaphors and these analogies kind of resonate with people because, you know, in this, this uncertain world, we're seeing so much change. I mean, you and I chatted about the gas prices. They're they're over six dollars out here in California, and that that leads to uncertainty. That leads to what's the future going to look like? Mm -hmm. You know, we had an, we had that episode around cryptocurrency. What's that going to look like? We're seeing the the political and war style volatility between Russia and Ukraine. That's raising a lot of questions and getting people to uh, you know really pay attention and try to stay well informed over there. And it just, you know, means that there's a lot of jumble right now. And, you know, that doesn't make it wrong. It just means we recognize that. And as you're going to hear with my voice, zoom out, try to get a, a little bit of a better picture of, of all the different things going on. And then we start to problem solve and try to um, integrate space to process and allow for conversation and the creation of awareness. Dude, it, you know what my first um, iterate like um, experience of this was actually at a place called the Speaking Circle. It was like a, a public speaking uh, improvement type situation, or that's what I at least thought uh, it was going to be. And you get there, and it's capped at like eight people at most, right? You're in a small room. Um, you're being recorded, and you get a tape of yourself afterwards. And the whole idea, you do all these um, exercises with people you're partnered up with that you've never met before that like, you know, you're making eye contact, for example, with them and you're not allowed to say anything or signal anything with your body language. Like you just keep staring, right? And it, it, it was for two minutes. It felt like the longest two minutes I've ever experienced, but it did show you like the urge to like react or to to say something to laugh to uh avoid that like discomfort in some way and then how that changes over the course of two minutes where yeah you're still uncomfortable at the end you're but maybe it's like you're you're way settled in you're it, there was a weird experience of creating space that that allowed and your whole goal was to uh hold the space for each speaker that was there. So it wasn't scripted. You weren't allowed to bring anything that was scripted or any ideas or topics what you're going to talk about. You just had to go up and for about one minute was the first exercise and then maybe three, you, you just talk. 
you just go uh whatever's kind of coming you try not to filter you just go and you make eye contact with everybody and you have to hold it for at least one second and if you're shifting around too fast you get called out from the back of the room and then the people who are in the audience they aren't allowed to give you any body language or pot you know this reaction or that reaction that's just kind of like holding eye contact and just listening right and it was such a weird experience the first uh go around uh, like the first round that i did the second round that was like a little longer you know it was a little more comfortable but it showed you like just the simple like pausing right now for a second right like that was just a second but it can feel like forever in certain contexts because we're so used to like inputs and noise and you know distraction everywhere that like a little bit of silence can like freak us out sometimes you know so um that whole experience was a game changer for me because I, it was so i'm very i was before that like now that i'm i go on stage and stuff i'm like used to that element of being a little bit in the unscripted zone and a little bit in the whatever but like back then this was you know uncharted territory for me where i, I couldn't imagine just like having no idea of where i was gonna go and kind of like you know being fully there and like speaking what i was thinking um so it was a very interesting experience because very rarely do you get the feeling of maybe eight other people holding that kind of a space for you you mm -hmm. know it just relates me to exposure right in the beginning you're observing somebody else and you're you're tangibly wanting to provide a reaction or inputs like you said <clears throat> and it's it's fascinating like as you were saying it it enhanced my awareness that you know when i'm having this conversation with you weekly it's like I want to nod my head. I want to like relate to you. I want to show you feedback of like, hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm holding space for you. And sometimes when I don't do anything, I'm like, well, I don't want him to think that I'm zoned out. I don't want I don't want the audience to, to think that I'm not checked in and not paying attention, not focused, not in this present moment. And it just is so fascinating. The the perceived judgments that come from either responding or not responding. And that's not always verbal. Sometimes that's just with like the nod of the head or the raise of the yeah. eyebrows or the slight squint of the eyes or the smile or the smirk. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating, like like you said. And I think, I think that goes back to what we talked about with some of the things going on in the world. Like not everything deserves a reaction. Sometimes, you know, we're going to see certain things going on and it's, it's like, hmm, Okay, like I'm, I'm processing, I'm recognizing that that's going on, but it's pretty far out of my control. So I'm not going to overly focus on it. I'm not going to allow it to live rent free in my brain, but I am going to acknowledge it, its existence and it'll pique my interest at appropriate times. So that way, you know, I, converse, I can converse with people about it and I stay well aware, you know, assu assuming that the the event either transpires or regresses or just stays stagnant. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it's very interesting the way you described that. I think exposure is really fascinating because you talked about in the beginning of being on stage, a pause like this feels like a very long time. Mm -hmm. But now we kind of like it. It gives us that, that opportunity to think the dust settles, we process information. And I think previously, you could probably relate to this too. Rather than the dust settling in that pause, it was almost like somebody had like an outdoor like leaf blower and everything started to speed up <laughs> yeah. really, really fast. The energy picked up, the noise got loud, the heart rate spiked, you start sweating. And then you get to the other side of that and you're like, wait, shoot, I lost my train of thought. I lost the momentum. I hope they can't tell what's going on. Right. It's just so interesting how a single pause can mean different things based on the exposure that you've had to that type of thing. And I, th I, I mean, true, the same dude. goes to say for space. 
some people will create space in the form of the spring cleaning, like I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be anxious like, oh, what if I need that thing? I got rid of it. Now it's gone forever. Oh my gosh. And then other people are going to be like, didn't use it, didn't need it, haven't touched it. Bye. Right. And, and it's just interesting how that one single event can have su such a different meaning based on the lenses and based on where we're at. Bro, there is something crazy that you referenced around like um, just referencing basically our past. This is, uh, you know that we talked about this on the podcast, How Emotions Are Made, this book by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, I think. And I was listening mm -hmm. to uh, her on a podcast with Lex Friedman. And it was remarkable some of the things that she said where, because uh, the book is very dense. I haven't even gotten all the way through it. Like it just one of those things where you skip around and you know take it in a little bit at a time but something that she said is that we are always when going into different situations uh, whether it's with other people or experiences we are constantly looking to our past to reference a similar situation that we've been in and that's why certain skills feel easier and stuff over time right like uh even going to the gym i remember like walking into the doors of of this crossfit gym when i first started and what it looked like to me what was going on in there how crazy it was just like whoa like where am i this looks amazing and then like i got to be there for a while right and repeated exposure after a little bit like it wasn't this thing on a pedestal anymore i still loved it but it was like oh i'm a part of this it's not better than me i'm like you know and that was only done through like basically uh more experiences being created that then became the past and this is what was mind-blowing and so kind of poetic was like she goes your your present is con like most of us look to our past to reference a lot of decisions that we make not just consciously but like your brain is just automatically doing that but we don't stop to think that like your past is being rewritten constantly because of the present right so but the presence yeah. now like three years ago is what's now part of my past versus maybe nine years ago i mean that's still part of my past right but like that's going to keep changing and the past five years will be full of these new experiences that you are now being present in and so i find that so uh fascinating because off air you also mentioned this idea of safety right feeling safe mm -hmm. in a space and you know i talked to a therapist about this once and she said that our biological need when we walk into a place we are asking ourselves am i safe here am i safe to and not just like physically but also am i safe to be my full self in front of this person in this situation in this environment it's the same reason why you would react differently maybe in a boardroom meeting and versus like your personality might be different where you know you're at a rave or something like that right two different contexts and um uh two different spaces where uh, it, it, it allows different parts of you to kind of shine through. So um, that whole safety concept in each space was so uh, relevant. And I think what creates part of that safety over time is that repeated exposure to it, right? Where uh, mm -hmm. you've been to this place five to 10 times and you're like, oh, okay, I'm not scared of this anymore. I know what's gonna happen. Uh, versus the first time or the first couple times, it's it, it can be, uh, you know, your, your heart rates pump in, you're, you're, you're feeling all the signs of just like uh, the flight or, uh, fight or flight response, you know? I think the way you talked about safety was, was perfect. Because oftentimes you say that word and immediately people think of like caution tape, they think about maybe wandering in the wrong neighborhood, they think about violence, but safety is also just the permission to be unapologetically yourself in that moment and not feel like you're going to be ripped apart, not feel like you're going to be judged. Um, and I mean, just to relate this to professional basketball, that's what I see with the Lakers point guard Russell Westbrook right now. I don't feel that he feels that he's safe out there. I think mm. he came in with all this expectation. And when you look statistically, he's never been a great shooter. And he's expected to be a great shooter all of a sudden. He still has pretty good statistics. He's, he's not performing, you know, to the level of, of expectation, but he's still performing pretty damn good. 
Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, when you have these expectations and the pressures, it shifts the, the reactionary behavior of the individual. And as a byproduct, they don't feel safe. They don't perform to the best of their capability. And neither side is content. And a really good friend of mine, he is a huge listener, contributor, and supporter to Human Evolution Project. His name is Max Needle. want to give him a quick little shout out. Shared an amazing quote with me. And that was, psychological safety is a prerequisite for radical candor. Oh, you said this. I like that. Yeah. You said this off air too. Yeah, man. I, I want I wanted to say it one more time for people to really hear it and let it sink in. Psychological safety is a prerequisite for radical candor. And what that means to me is you and I can be on two separate ends of the street. But if we cognitively feel safe, well, now we can have this optimal expression, even if we don't agree. And we can have a healthy conversation in what I would describe as the messy middle. Mm -hmm. And when you look at so many different topics in the world, if we all agree on everything, it's kind of a boring world. There's kind of not a ton of innovation. There's not a lot of creativity. There's limited reaction because people are just going to go, hmm, that's cool. It's not like reactionary things and like, you know, disagreeing. I mean, you look at certain conversations that are had on, on the news and the media, and, you know, whenever there's disagreement, what does it lead to? Arguing, yelling. Memes. It's so <laughs> loud. If you're in a room and everybody's screaming, nothing gets heard. Right. And what I love about this concept of psychological safety is that if you feel safe and respected and I feel safe and respected, we give each other the opportunity to share their truth or share their headspace around that topic. And that's so much more fun where it becomes the art of conversation, the art of connecting. And then there's beauty within relationship building, even if we disagree, because we don't disagree out of disrespect. We disagree based on what you described a moment ago, which is we have different pasts. We have different reference points that are definitely impacting our current state that are definitely impacting our current psychological state of affairs and how we view the world. And guess what? That's okay. And I think creating that style of dialogue can relate to so many things. It can relate to fitness, right? I mentioned to you, I had the famous Joel Seedman on the podcast. He's all about limited range of motion and max muscle contractility at 90 degrees. But then I also have great conversations with Ben Patrick, who's the knees over toes guy, who really challenges traditional strength and conditioning principles and talks about ass to grass and getting up on the toes and the balls of the feet and doing things that would also be perceived as unorthodox in traditional strength training. They're both right. And they both have mutual respect for one another which allows for this push and pull in the messy middle, the sharing of information, the new innovation of fitness. And we always talk about the silly smoothie analogy. We don't always have to put the same ingredients inside the blender to create something that's really delicious. Sometimes we're gonna, we're gonna try something different. You know what? I, I wanna actually try putting this in today and see what that tastes like. See how it makes me feel. And sometimes that leads to magic, like, man, why didn't I think of that sooner? And then other times you're like, oh, that wasn't a good choice. I don't need to do that again. But it's through the art and the courage of trying and the, the respect that ultimately leads to these really cool innovations on the other side. Yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> there's value, I guess, even for the user or the person who's, I guess, consuming, let's say on the other end, Joel stuff and... Uh, the, the knees over toes guy as well, they, it, you don't have to be all or nothing, right? You don't have to fill your space with all of Joel or all of, you know, this guy. It's like a little bit of each can exist. And even consuming both, even if you are all in one camp or the other, sometimes will give you a 
more enhanced context around what you're doing. It either reinforces your belief and makes it stronger in whatever you're doing and how you, uh, you know, what you're, uh, you find kind of what you, you're passionate about, what your tendencies are like, no, you know, I, I don't agree with that, or I do agree with this. And here's why it, it's a jumping off point that it can offer um, for further discussion, which you're right, if, if it's done in a very um, balanced way, where it's, it's really like, hey, let's, let's, let's uh like we're preparing for a, a case in a courtroom you know what i mean like and we're doing mock trials like you're poking and trying to find different angles and there's no like it, it's a mock trial it's not the real thing you know what i mean so there's value in uh in in playing that game i think in your head i also think it's challenging people to upgrade their argument i disagree with you but if your argument's good enough you might be able to sway my stance mhm mm Yes. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is being being open because a, a lot of times there's no space reserved for being wrong or being be, being open to revising what you said or what you thought. It's kind of like, OK, once we said it, we got to go all in here. There's no going back. I mean, I watched the Boeing documentary the other night and that was I haven't seen that. I've heard good things Dude, about it. Amazing. But it's also it makes you go like. Boeing really, uh, they just went all in, you know, like they did not uh, acknowledge whatsoever that they were wrong, that they, it was anything on, they kept just pushing the blame onto other people, the pilots and all this stuff. And even in, in I mean, I won't ruin the whole thing for you, but there's this, this whole, uh, like a company like that, it was crazy to, to watch them be the type of people where you're like, wow, you really think you're going to pull over a fast one on all of us just because you're sticking with your story. You're sticking with what you, but like when we have people who are open and apologize or admit that they're wrong or um, not even admit that they're wrong in such a strong way, but like, Hey man, you know, like a couple months ago on a podcast episode, I said this and, and since then I've learned this and here's what, Here's what I would say on that now, right? That's a very, I, I really value anybody who gives me a perspective like that because that's something to learn from, right? Not just like replicate that's what, what that person's doing. That's what gravitated me towards Carl Paoli. Like he said that on a YouTube video one time, like, hey guys, this is what I know up until this point, but this is subject to change on a mm -hmm. video that I make tomorrow based on acquired knowledge, information, and experience. And I think what's, what's really tough is sometimes being wrong comes in the form of a, a major slap on the wrist, whether that's legally, whether that's monetarily. I mean, we could relate that to like the steroid scandals in baseball, right? Mm -hmm. Like these guys are trying to perform at a high level. There's tremendous pressure. They're trying to earn that next paycheck. They feel like they're maybe in a slump or the yips, or maybe they're battling injury and they don't want their agent and you know the, the team to know about it. And so they're battling this cognitive warfare and as a byproduct, sometimes have a slip of their, of their character and they're like, you know what, this steroid or this human growth hormone is going to be an awesome fix. So that way I can keep doing what I'm doing. And it, it, it's not easy to accept those consequences. People deny, deny, deny. But ultimately, if you go public and you say exactly what I just said, like, Hey, I felt the pressure of the world on my body and my mind. And I was really, my intentions were good. And, you know, despite putting in the work consistently, like my body just was not performing. And I felt like that was going to be an outlet to kind of problem solve. And obviously I'm suffering the consequences now. And I realized that that was not a good choice. That's so much better than denying to your grave. And then obviously the blood tests and all the different evidence come out that it's like, all right, not only did you screw up once, but now you're lying about it and you're trying to bury it. And it just, it just leads down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. I agree, man. I, I wonder, um, cause you get to talk to people all the time who are very, very high performers. I mean, just Joel and uh, a couple other people you mentioned alone that you've recently talked to have a lot going on, right? They are very elite in their 
field and they are at the same time juggling two, three, four other side projects or priorities um, on top of that, that main thing that you might know them for or I might know them for. What have you found, I guess, that has allowed them to create space because for those are great examples because they're busy, right? They're super busy. There's a lot going on. How does somebody of that caliber manage to create space? What, and, and not just one person, but have you found any trends from like your past five, 10, I don't know, 20 conversations? Yeah, that's a really awesome question. And, you know, if I were to give a piece of advice and a common thread that I can kind of pull from a lot of these high performers, uh, time block, right? There are mm. times throughout their day where their phone goes straight into airplane mode mm. face down so they can focus on the craft at hand. Um, we've referenced it before. Jason Kalipa calls it in his terminology, the AMRAP mentality. So he may set, all right, for this next two hours, I'm focusing just on the creativity of this project. And I know a lot of people that do that. I was very fortunate over the weekend to connect with Harvey Martin, who's a uh, mindset um breath style coach. He's a uh, mm. mind strong on Instagram and he is a consultant for the San Francisco giants. And, you know, he integrates that exact strategy where he goes into airplane mode. He's writing a book right now around the uh, benefits and the protocols associated with breath work and breath therapy, because he was a big time pitcher for the brewers, uh, basically came face to face with the yips and he was paid to throw strikes. He couldn't throw strikes anymore. And a lot of that was in between his ears. Overcome with anxiety where he was a mouth breather. <sighs> Breath was really high, tense within the neck, as we kind of briefly described um, offline. And this completely resonates with the guys over at XPT and the director of performance, PJ Nessler, and his connection with big time wave surfer Laird Hamilton. And then his wife, you know, former professional volleyball player, Gabby Reese. They all integrate the art of breath is kind of how they describe it. And if I can steal the terminology from the Enlifted crew, who I was fortunate to kind of connect with, and Mark England, who has an awesome TED Talk around the power of language, the terminology is low and slow. When the world gets you really, really high and fast and sped up, you can create space by bringing your breath low and slow and trying to get it out of your neck and shoulders and bringing it down to the diaphragm where you belly breathe. And not just in a linear fashion of forward and back, but 360 degrees. To take it a, a layer deeper, strive to nasal breathe as often as possible. These are major little tidbits that are so simple to apply. Um, Dr. Andrew, Andrew Huberman, who's a really big time doctor up at Stanford, talks about the double nasal inhale followed by the mouth exhale. And it's like this. And he talks about that creating a little bit of a better relationship between oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so when we start getting really high in the CO2 within our system, that's when the breath starts to get a little bit panicky. That's when anxiety starts to set in. And so, you know, when you're approaching a really big time meeting, you know, maybe five to 10 times you integrate the, or you're getting, you're walking towards the starting mat of a race or a, or a fitness event or a tough, tough mutter. Maybe you integrate some of those breath protocols to optimize that relationship between, like I said, carbon dioxide and oxygen. And that can kind of get you closer to even keel. Because one of the, the things we're looking to do with regards to this creating of space, homeostasis is relatively even keel. You're not too high. You're not too low. It's unrealistic to expect all of us to be 100% at this optimal level all the time. There are going to be highs, lows, or as I like to say, peaks and valleys periodically throughout life. But by integrating mindset, integrating optimal sleep, integrating movement, um, optimal nutrition, breath work, uh, connection with, with the world and grounding. Now these peaks and valleys maybe are a little bit closer to that level of homeostasis 
versus having really high light, high highs followed by really low lows. And that's where you have this like cognitive and physical volatility of like sometimes you're in flow state and then other times you're depressed. Mm -hmm. And it's like you don't want to have those huge sways. If you can try your best to integrate some of this breath work, your performance is better. Your relationships are better. Your, your efficiency throughout your day is better. And part of that is rather than trying to multitask, Time blocking, blocking out, hey, I'm going to be 100% where my feet are for this present moment to attack this task, then I'm going to move on. And I'm going to practice the art of being okay if the task is unfinished. And once again, that comes back to exposure because stubborn people like myself don't like when things are unfinished. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's a hard thing to do, man. Yeah. And I don't know. I think there's, um, there, there's something fascinating about how uh, and I got this, I think, from the <clears throat> Lisa Feldman um, you know, interview as well. But she was talking about how our um, our brains are like when we are intaking new uh, information or experiences and like you hear people give you recommendations on breathing techniques and stuff like it's everywhere and it can feel like, oh, is 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 it just hype? Is it the new keto? Is it the new, but it's like, there is a true real rhyme and reason for why it is so talked about and why it's the hot thing that is staying hot, uh, is because it is the predecessor to any other, uh, emotions and feelings and action and thoughts and things that typically follow. So it's the first line of reaction to something. And so mm -hmm. that's why like, actually it's your heart rate, right? Which is controlled by your breathing uh, heavily. Mm -hmm. So if your heart rate, uh, let's like, if you're breathing shallow, one of the things that will happen is your heart rate speeds up, right? And so that is the thing that then signals to your brain like, hey, uh, this, is, this is not safe. This is not a good situation. Like we're in panic mode. Like Things that you don't even have control of start happening. Your mouth starts drying up and you start, you know, palms start getting sweaty, all that good stuff. So there's a good reason for the low and slow that you just described that mm -hmm. it can get lost in in kind of just the technique sometimes because I'm a big fan of breathing techniques and um, I love learning about them from different people. But I know that uh, it's also become kind of like a little more mainstream at this point, like meditation almost, right? Where people are like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, it's good for you. But like, we kind of forget the original reason of why it's so important. It's so, box checking. Yeah. Which 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 is tough, right? Like I, I challenge people to journal all the time because as I say, I say it like 10 times a day. I'm sure people are sick of hearing it, but writing fills the gaps within our thinking. Mm -hmm. And so often people say, oh yeah, I write, I journal. It's like, do you really though? Or are you just checking the box? Are you opening your daily stoic while you have a cup of coffee and some eggs in the morning, but you're not actually getting the pen and putting your thoughts to paper. And that's the same thing with fitness. Like you can have optimal focus and contractility of the muscle fiber and try to put out intensity, or you can go in there and spin your wheels and then wonder like, why am I not losing weight? I don't understand. I'm there. I'm showing up. I'm just, but you're box checking. And I think that's the same thing with meditating. People want to post on their Instagram stories, look, I've got a 160-day streak of meditating. It's like, that's awesome. I, I, I honored that 100%. But were you there? Did you melt your thoughts and create space and acknowledge the bad things that exist and, and let go of them? Did you try your best to lighten the, back of, of heavy, the bag of heavy rocks that you're carrying? And that's my challenge to people. Like, are you taking personal accountability to actually do the things? Or are you trying to meditate, do breath work, be an entrepreneur, go, go do all these 85 different things because it sounds really sexy and it, it, it just occupies your mind, your time, your space and makes you really busy. So you sound like a high performer, but in reality, you're just trying to be busy to deflect from your actual thoughts. Yeah, it's like, what is fat in the space right what can be trimmed mm -hmm. out that it i mean it should be motivating instantly that it will create more space right whether you want to use it for something or not like it's it can be allocated 
towards just nothingness towards towards you know uh like relaxation towards stuff that's not contributing towards goals but that pain normally isn't felt of like oh i'm doing all this unnecessary stuff like we don't audit that until your book you're packed you're just you're like why am i why am i packed why am i back to back doing these things that i don't want to do or why is it more frustrating or stressful than usual or whatever um yeah so, so i don't know i think i think there's there's something to i think it, i think it goes back to this everything is super important until your health declines or until yeah. you're sick yeah and then you realize there there was really only one thing that mattered your health that is the hub that is the thing that allows you to think that's the thing that allows for your heart rate to flow that is the thing that allows for breath work that's the thing that allows for eye contact or lack of eye contact or connection with other people but like we borrow from our bank of health all the time we take loans from from our sleep we have sleepless nights to pursue the thing and you know ultimately we're paying for something that really doesn't matter. And that's not to, to like devalue all the things that people are doing. It's just also to recognize that having depth with yourself is truly what matters most. And what I mean by that is rather than saying you're doing all these things to get that external validation, when you're with you in those scary, quiet moments, and I paused so people could feel that. What's really serving you? What's really allowing you to feel like you're coming alive? What's really allowing you to totally feel like you are you? And it goes back to this concept of art. When somebody is creating a sculpture, they don't start by trying to master the details. They just get, get, get the products and the, the ingredients up there. And then over time, they have to trim all the external fat, as you mentioned. And then over time, they get into the nuanced details, which enable them to create this artistry that's beautiful to the human eye. But I think sometimes we try to do the details before we can do the broad and inclusive things that lead to consistency. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it for this external validation to get a pat on the back for being busy because the hustle and the grind is so cool right now. But I, I, I want to share this story. You'll appreciate this. I had this guy come in, super high performer, um, has a beautiful wife, um, has his own business, incredibly busy because he's very good at his craft. And oftentimes, like, he'll reference Instagram, like, hey, I want to do these exercises. Or he'll, like you know, see what's going on, you know, in other class settings or whatnot. And he'll just be like, it's shiny objects. And I want to do all these <laughs> yeah. things. So the other day I just gave him two exercises in a dynamic warm up. in his meat and potatoes or, or main event of his session. We did front squats and ring rows. And then we concluded with a little bit of an interval piece with running and goblet squats. He did six exercises, six he came back the next day and he was like, bro, I feel so strong. I feel so good. Yeah, I'm really sore, but I feel good because I moved with intention mm -hmm. and I felt like I could really focus on the craft because I didn't have six different things to pursue at, at one time. It was six different exercises in a very concentrated fashion in, in couplet form. So two exercises paired at a time. And it just kind of goes back to that mindset of more is not better. Mm -hmm. better is better and i think that that overarching piece allows you to realize that creating space allows for more concentration to make certain things better well dude it's like uh i think that this is already a term but concentration curls like not the exercise but doing curls mm. of concentrated focus tasks right because you, that's really the space we found that it's not just about the 10,000 hours, right? It was, but now it's more so about the focused 10,000 hours, the 10,000 hours of uh, struggle, not knowing if this is the right thing, like living in that space is kind of more so what contributes to those 10,000 hours. So how do you create space and pockets of concentration? Because 
it, it's hard when if you've got something different you're doing every 30 minutes you, you're bouncing from thing to thing it's it's a tough thing to fit in and that's where i think like anywhere where you can um have like up to two hours i mean it's very difficult to uh, fit that in uh logistically sometimes but like on a weekend or on an at a after work or something like that like being able to lock in for 90 minutes to two hours like a, a full rem cycle type deal you give mm -hmm. yourself enough space to let's say if you're a painting to just get your canvas set up to get the brushes washed and ready and the whole you know putting your clothes on change it like there's a whole series of events that you need to preserve space for or else the next thing doesn't happen right i know that for me when i want to record a video there's this checklist of items that i'm like it takes a bit of time to do that to set it up that if i try to squeeze it in like oh man I'm talking to bryce in 30 minutes let's see if i can knock that out in in the next 30 minutes like I'm not giving myself enough space to go through the stages that I kind of need to. So I think you're right. It's it's acknowledging that each piece of a process, specifically like that concentration curl aspect is one part of it. Like have space that is dedicated towards living there and working on the tough parts here. Mm -hmm. Then I think there is also uh, space for easy or medium grade things to exist obviously stuff you're good at stuff you really enjoy the things you said what makes you feel the most you um mm -hmm. there's ways for you to it might not be like every day all day two hours you know uh to start but it, it uh, once a week twice a week on weekends throughout the week like can inject a whole lot of joy into your life if it's yeah, focused sure. on the right things I have, a, I have a question for you yeah so so one of the things that i notice in high performers is they can pivot very fast so they do time block they go from one task and then they you know may let's say that task is you know creating a a pitch deck for a company and then the next conversation they jump in you know 90 minutes later is now um, roles for an employee that they that that works for them and then they're pivoting next to oh i've got to take my kids to their soccer game that's three different arenas in a very short amount of time and i think sometimes when we when we look at monetization or capitalism it's like you look at a google calendar and it's like this is what i'm paid for this is what i'm not paid for this is what i'm paid for right does that kind of make sense yes and um, it, it, it's like you're you're blocking things out or you can look at like a management system for for a company and it's like you look at somebody's schedule like throughout the day and like it's built in so all eight hours are accounted for so that's what they're paid for but sometimes in between each one of those things there's a process of priming is what i would say or or marinating the system before you get yeah. into that next thing and you know i'll definitely say like before clients come in i like to move a little bit i like to integrate whether that's pull-ups or burpees or push-ups or some sort of lift and that primes my system to have space to then problem solve appropriately when people come in or to have space if they need to to unload something from their day um, or to be able to demonstrate movement appropriately where my body's primed to do something like that and I feel like sometimes the, the priming or the space is not accounted for in our brain. Sometimes mm -hmm. we only think, when you look at the concentration curl, for example, you probably need to up your core body temperature before that. You probably need to wake up the elbow joint a little bit before just throwing on what you would describe as maybe your peak sets of that concentration curl. And then you probably need a little bit of down regulating so you don't leave there like unable to operate your car and like, you know, where your heart rate's so high, where you're just in this chronic flux of stress. And so on the book ended portions of that concentrated curl, there's a priming and then there's a down regulating. And I'm using that in, in the fitness analogy, but that can be related to really anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, like it, it sparks my interest a little bit around how do we create space to allow for those things that are so important. So that way, when you do get to the main event of whatever that is, 
you are showing up at your peak form, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And then you're, you're pivoting in a gradual down regulation. So that way, when you get to the next thing, let's say, for example, your, your child's soccer game, you're not in the same state that you were in the, in the previous moment in your life. And so what, do you, what are your thoughts on creating space in the priming and down regulating associated with how people pivot into different moments within their life? I guess I would look at this as like task switching, right? And I've heard that the task switching is like the killer of productivity, right? So if you know you that's why if you have something that's every 15 minutes, it's changing every 30 minutes, your attention is broken, you're being disrupted, you're answering emails, whatever, like, that is going to destroy your ability to actually focus and stay focused for any definitive period of time. So I think that being able to minimize task switching where possible is is a great idea, right? So whenever you can batch, whenever you can, um, you know, uh, like emails is one example, right? Like check it twice or three times a day versus like having the notification for every email come to your phone. And then you see it every, every email comes through, even the promotions. It's like, that is task switching, even when you don't think about it, because you might be writing and then all of a sudden now you're consuming an input and then you're trying to go back to writing. And so minimizing that where you can obviously is preferable. But then after that, I think it's probably identifying what are maybe because there's so many different tasks that we probably have to do throughout the day and how do you narrow it down maybe to three? Like what are your top three? And then how do you how do you allocate the most space maybe to that trifecta, right? Like let's say that mm -hmm. soccer game, you know, something at work and then being able to switch to this. It's uh, it's, it's knowing, like, I think we all can task switch, right? We can all do it. It's just uh, expensive for the brain, obviously, to do that. So I think you have to decide early on in the day, maybe where are those three things that I'm going to use up my task switches on? You know, it's like on who wants to be a millionaire, your three lifelines, where are you going to use it? Mm -hmm. So I think you got to decide on that or else it will get used automatically. And then you have no energy for kind of when it, when it matters. But, um, yeah, I think, I think flowing in and out, I mean, that's where breathing obviously helps for sure. But I think also a, uh, like, Cal Newport calls it a uh, scheduled shutdown. So being able mm. to have some form of a ritual that signals that you are shutting down the same way that you have some type of uh, like putting your weightlifting shoes on signals. All right, it's time to train. It's time to get after it, right? It gets this alter ego in play for you. So the same thing kind of has to be an exit in some format where um, – you know, uh, like I do that. I've started to do that over the past week or two where like after time blocking, like I kind of physically write down what time I would like to be done by. And mm -hmm. then what happens, he says, is when you do need to deal with something after that time, you might still deal with it, of course, but your brain, instead of getting sucked into it and just, all right, we're back up and we're going all in on this now it will recognize, hey, we've shut down already. This is outside of the shutdown time for this. But um, you know what I mean? You're, you're going to be able to bounce back a little bit quicker if no, you've I established you that boundary. No, I think you really well around task switching being the killer of productivity and trying to batch things. I think your your description of scheduled shutdown is, is crucial and having maybe a ritual that allows you to shift gears. I think those things are incredibly helpful. And I just, I had so much fun chatting with you today around creating space. I think there's a lot of value there for people so they don't get too stuck in the weeds. Business owners like to say, you know, when you're working in the business, you can't always work on the business. And sometimes, you know, it's important to zoom out, find ways to get your breath low and slow and, you know, create a little bit of space, optimize and practice the art of that spring cleaning you know, for, for, for lack of a better analogy. And the last thing I'd like to share with people is it's okay. I think that's a really powerful line. Like we're all trying to do our best and it, it's okay if, if we fail sometimes. It's okay if we don't 
always create space, but it's the pursuit to try. It's the awareness factor. I think all of us got to experience that little moment where you and I were describing breath. I definitely was more cognizant of my breath as we were talking about that. Was it perfect? No. Mm -hmm. Was I attempting to make it low and slow? Yeah. Was I attempting to make it nasal? Yeah. And so I think that that's, that's where we start. And then we, we optimize through the art of practice not through the art of, of beating ourselves up. And there's not always a beautiful rhyme or reason to it. It's just, it's that awareness factor. And I think life's not really meant to be lived perfectly, but it's definitely meant to be lived. Mm -hmm. And that can be boldly, beautifully, wildly. Um, it's going to be full of quite a bit of uncertainty as we described as well, but it needs to be magically lived. And I think applying a lot of these principles and concepts that we're so fortunate to describe here and discuss here on the human evolution project can kind of arm you with some special nuggets and some tools to uh, make your journey a little bit more fun along the way. For sure, man. Thanks for sharing your space with me today. This was fun. And uh, anybody who listened and enjoyed this, please rate, review, subscribe. That stuff always helps uh, wherever you're at, Apple, Spotify, and um yeah, another week, another great conversation. Make sure to reach out to us. We'd love hearing from you and, um, you know, hearing how it, this show or these episodes impact you in your everyday life. So the real Bryce Smith for Bryce on Instagram and uh, Pod Mahal for me or Mizba.hawk uh, on Instagram as well. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you guys for peeling back the layers of the human experience. Mm -hmm.